All right, let's do this study together for the chapter 8 test. Um, when you want to write something in standard form, remember that you're writing from the highest power to the lowest power. So we want to put the 5x cubed first. And if we can, we would combine like terms, but there's in these, there's going to be none to combine. Put the next highest power, then the next highest, and finally the lowest power, which in this term, have this uh, instance happens to be a constant term. Next one, same thing, standard form. It has to be in descending order, highest power. Next highest is the second power. So that's the 2x squared. Next highest is the 9x. And finally, the constant term happens to be the lowest power. Notice how there's some missing in between, but that doesn't matter. Highest power to lowest power is how you write in the text, standard. When you're adding and subtracting, you just combine like terms. So I like to either highlight or circle or do something to draw my attention to like terms. So I'm going to circle all the x squareds, I'm going to box all the x to the first power terms, and underline all the ones that are like the constant terms. That's technically a degree of zero on the x. And so then you add the coefficients. You do not add the exponents. So you get 6x squared, not 6x to the fourth, plus 16x plus 14. Really important that you remember, you don't add the exponents. If you take a 4 centimeter squared and add it to 2 centimeters squared, you don't get, you get 6 centimeters squared. You don't get 6 centimeters to the fourth. Don't add the powers, only add the coefficients. When you're subtracting, you got to be a little bit more careful because when you subtract everything in these parentheses, you got to kind of distribute the negative. So like when I distribute this negative here in front of the 6, it's like a double negative, so it's positive. If you want, you can visualize these stacked. For this one, I'm going to write them stacked. So that's plus 5x squared. That's a plus negative 8x. So I'm just going to write minus 8x. And this is minus negative 6, but I'm just going to write plus 6. So if it helps you to stack them, you know, that can keep you more organized, or you can do the little thing with the circling, boxing, and underlining, if that makes more sense to you. Either way you do it, combine uh, by adding only the coefficients. Do not do anything with the powers, like this x and x don't cancel out or anything. Five potatoes uh, minus eight potatoes is negative three potatoes. So once you combine like terms, make sure it's in descending order. It is, so that's our answer. For number five, we have subtraction again. What I like to do is change this subtraction to addition, distribute the negative by changing all these signs, and then either circle or box or right underneath um, this thing. But here's a problem. Wait, oh, oh, man, this one has a fourth power. This one doesn't have a fourth power. So I can't combine this 5x to the fourth and this 3x to the second. So you really would have to do more like this. You have 5x to the fourth. And then you wouldn't write anything underneath there. And you don't have to write this, but there is no x to the third power, but just to save space for it, I'm going to put that. There is no x to the second power term. There is a 7x term, and that's a first power term and a constant term. And here's the advantage of putting, like, even the things that, like, putting all the powers, especially when you're combining, like, terms or subtracting, now have a spot to put the negative 3x squared underneath. Then negative 3x squared goes underneath this 0x squared. And then the plus 2x goes here. And this is actually a subtract a negative 9, however you choose to see it. And now you can combine those. Like I said, you don't really need this because there's nothing to combine there. So it's 5x to the fourth minus 3x squared plus 9x minus 7. You have to put it in descending order. We don't have to write the x cubed term because you know, uh, you know, zero times x cubed is zero. So there's no need to make a place marker for it since there's no, um, it's not present in this answer. For number six, if you notice here, we have, um, there's an x cubed and there's an x cubed and there's an x. Oh, there's not an x squared. Oh, but this one has an x squared. So be careful that you don't accidentally like combine these just because it's the second one and the second one, you can't combine them. So the x cubed, we can combine. Negative 7 and a 6 make a negative 1 x cubed, writing the ones after them. And because x cubed naturally follows an x, actually, let me, let me just do it like what I call the wrong way, and then I'll fix it. So there is no x term to combine here. Then I'm going to do the plus 10x squared, 
which there's no x squared combined with that, so it just it just doesn't get mixed with anything. And then if you take negative six and a three, it makes a negative three. Now this answer is right, but it's not in standard form. So you should write the negative x cubed first. Again, I didn't write the one that time, but it's totally optional. I actually kind of prefer to write the one. But then you write the x squared term second. Then you write the x to the first power term. You can put a little one right there if you want to. There's, you know, or you can at least think it that it's there. And then subtract three. This is the proper answer. You should always put it in descending order. It just looks nicer. It makes it easier to um, um, combine and work with stuff when they're in descending order. We've added and subtracted, so now we're going to multiply. Pretty much always when you're multiplying polynomials, you're often going to be dealing with distributive property because if you have at least a binomial, something with two terms, you're going to be distributing somehow. So distribute that here, a p to the first times a p to the second. That's negative 8p to the third. And then, you know, negative times a positive, so that's another negative right here. And that's going to be 3p to the second. That's it. Just distribute, just distribute what's outside to the inside. And then we got a binomial of a third degree. For number eight, you may call this FOIL, but there's really no reason to call it. It's just distributive property. If you distribute these two right here, you get r squared plus 6r. And if you distribute, you know, the eight to the other two guys in this other car here, this other uh, factor here, we get plus 8r. And then we get multiply 8 times 6, you get 48. And notice that almost always your terms that are next to each other will likely be able to combine. So simplify that to r squared plus 14r plus 48. And then later you'll notice when we factor, we do this the opposite way. We're given a problem like this, and we factor into these two. But factoring and multiplying are just opposite. You know, that one's going forwards, one going backwards. One's going backwards. We're getting more practice with multiplying binomials now. Okay, uh, same one here. Multiply, distribute the 5w. We got 10w squared plus uh, 5 times. It's 35w. Distribute the negative 6. You get negative 12w minus 42. And then we just combine the middle terms. And you get 10w squared plus 23w minus 42. Number 10 is a good example of why I don't like to teach the FOIL mnemonic that the book sometimes teaches. Because if you use FOIL here, you'll completely skip over the 4S term. That FOIL is like the first, outer, inner, last. It's a great little mnemonic, but it doesn't work unless you're doing a binomial times a binomial. As soon as you do something like a trinomial, like this negative 4S isn't the outer, the inner, the last. It's none of those. So... Just do it, you know, distributive property. That's all it is. Uh, this is 28s to the third power, four times, so that's negative 16s squared. Four times three is 12, so that's plus 12s. And then now I'll do this distributing the five ones in blue. That's plus 35s squared minus 20s plus 15. And you'll notice that the like terms are a little further away, but let me box the two s squared terms, and I'm going to combine those. Notice how it's a good idea to box the sign that's in front, too. Like, I didn't just box the 16, I boxed the negative. And just to be consistent, let me box the plus in front of the 35. And then for the s to the first power terms, I'm going to circle those instead of box them, so that, you know, I can tell the difference. And then you just combine those like terms. You can also use the rectangular method, like you'll see I did that on the um, study guide for the quiz if you choose to do it that way, but distributive property always work. And uh, you just combine your like terms, make sure it's in standard form, which by default, you know, it should be. You know, combine your highest powers first. For number 11, you wanna be careful. The temptation might be to distribute the second power, and you might just think, oh, Q squared minus one squared, and that's it, but this would be wrong. When you're squaring the binomial, what you're basically doing is you're writing that binomial twice. And even though this gives you like close to the right answer, it doesn't give you the full right answer. You distribute the Q, you get Q squared minus 1Q. And then the blue ones, you get minus 1Q right there. And then negative 1 times 1 is 1. So it's like plus 1. So this is your answer, but combine those like terms. 
and you get q, skew, q squared minus 2q plus 1. There is a shortcut for doing this, like where you recognize 2q is the twice the product of these. If you want to use that shortcut, you're welcome. Number 12, we're still doing distributive property. Distribute this, you get 9g squared plus 15g. Distribute the negative 5, and you get minus 15g minus 25. If you notice, because these are two conjugates, same terms, different signs, you can expect the middle to cancel out. So that's 9g squared minus 25. Number 13, it's really just forcing a word problem context for polynomials, but multiplying a base times a height, you know, is a good application for this. So 4x plus 7 is your, or length in your, if you're in your width, if you want to call it that. So take those things. To get area, we multiply length times width. So multiply length times width, again, by just doing distributive property. So we get... 12x squared minus, or that's 8x, and then 7 times 3, and that's 21x, and that's positive, and then 7 times negative 2, minus 14x, uh, minus 14, because there's no x on either of those, and you combine like two. And you got it in descending order, that's your answer. The first factoring we learned to do is factoring out a GCF. So you're pulling out what the numbers have in common and what the letters have in common. Uh, the variables. The highest variable we see is an x squared, so we're going to pull that out of everything. I'm going to do that first, so it's going to be like an x to the fourth for this term, and then it's going to be, if you pull out the x squared, well, there's nothing left, and like as far as x is, and if you pull two x's out of five x's, there's only three x's left. And then, this is a little harder, but finding what number they all divide by. You can take this a piece at a time. You can like try to just go, oh, well, they're all even, so I can for sure pull out a two. And you might be able to pull out something bigger, but then you'll notice it in the numbers if they have a common factor. So make it easy on yourself. Just pull out the number that's obvious. I'm going to pull out a two. And so if you divide 16 by two, you get eight. Divide 22 by two, you get 11. That's a prime number, so that's good. And if you divide 30 by two, you get 15. So this is your answer. And if you want, you can write this in descending order. But, I mean, since they really either answer is acceptable. We factored it. We achieved the objective. Um, so we're good. All right, for this one, uh, 7 is a prime number. So it's, unless all these are divisible by 7, you can't factor a number. So you'll only be able to pull a variable out. So we get pull out those 2Vs. You get 7V. Pull out the 2Vs. You just left 10, pull out 2Vs, you get 9V squared, and this is the answer. You could also write this in descending order if you want, but it's factored. All right, so the difference between factoring out a GCF and, like, say you're given a trinomial and you're told just a factor, if I don't specify GCF, um, you can assume that's going to be like this. So remember, the last number is the product. My favorite way to get 72, there's a lot of ways to get it. It could be 36 times 2. It could be 72 times 1. But I'm guessing it'll probably be 9 times 8. That's my favorite way to get 72. And here's how I can confirm it works out. 9 times 8 is 72. 9 plus 8 is 17. 8 all checks out. All the signs are positive. So we got two pluses. But this would take just some guessing and checking and experimenting. For you to be able to do it that fast. For number 17, it's still factoring it into a trinomial and two binomials. What makes this harder is the number four here. So there's going to be a lot more possibilities, but what makes it easy is, is the number seven. The number seven's prime. The only one to get that is seven times one. So man, this 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 is a lot harder. This could be a 2v and a 2v, or it could be um, it could be a 4v and a 1v. But let me just try 2v and 2v. All right, and then for the signs, I know there's a positive on the end, a negative in the middle. So a positive product, but a negative sum means two subtraction signs. Then just hope you got it right. This is negative 14v right here, and that's negative 2v. Hey, look, it worked out on the first try. So this is the answer to uh, the prompt of factoring this expression. 
let me uh, show you uh, when we previewed chapter nine I showed you the quadratic formula and you can get hints and it might be hard for you to interpret this so you might not want to do um, what I'm about to show you necessarily but even though we use this to find the quadratic formula to find solutions you can use it to at least give you hints on the factors so see how the factors are like 3.5 and 0 0.5 well the 0 0.5 like since you're dividing by two, that's where the 0.5 comes from. So that could give you a good hint. That's a two and a two that go here. The 3.5 comes from this solution. If you take, if you set this equal to zero and do seven divided by two, you get 3.5. So this can give you the quadratic form and give you hints on how to factor if you find the factoring, you know, difficult. For number 18, this is still pretty easy to factor because I mean n and n and then like, oh, it's actually one of those special cases. You don't have to recognize it, but 8 times 8 is most people's favorite way to get 64. And then 8 added to an 8 gives you 16. We know that they're both be negative. So this is clearly the way to factor this. Another way you should recognize to write this, um, n minus 8 squared. This is a little more preferred as the correct answer because it's, it's just more compact. But to show you again how we can use the quadratic formula to solve that, I'm gonna put the coefficients, one, negative 16, and 64. Even though it's easy to factor, like look, eight and eight, so the solutions, not, remember what the, you know, if you haven't looked at chapter nine when you're watching this video or aren't familiar with it, um, you might go, wait, why is there a positive eight versus here it's a minus eight? But you should recall that when you set this equal to zero, you get eight minus eight is zero as the solutions. But these solutions can give you hints on what numbers go here as a fact. Okay, again, we have the difficult case where this number isn't a one, that's a six. It's like, ah, it can make things really tough. But first thing you should check is if everything can be divided by either that number or some factor of this, or either by two or three or six itself. I can actually factor out the six. If you factor that out, and, and what, what you're kind of doing is you're dividing by six, sort of. And so you divide this out, you get t squared, divide 54 by six, you get nine. And so now this could be factored further. This thing right here, that's the, the little conjugates there. So t minus three, t plus three, and then the six is right there. This is the complete factored form of this polynomial. Similarly, number uh, 121, uh, sorry, number 20, uh, is that conjugate case. This is a difference of two perfect squares, so it's gonna factor into two conjugates. The only way you can get like no middle term here is if it cancels out somehow, and that only happens when these numbers are the same, but the signs are opposite. Remember, the order doesn't matter. If you wrote in y minus 11 first and then y plus 11 second, that's still going to be marked correct. So either either order, because of the commutative property, will be correct. Okay, number 21, since we didn't go over section 7.8, which is the uh, factor by grouping, we're not going to cover number 21 or 22. Um, what we are going to do, we are going to look at 23. Okay, and we're not going to, but the ones where there's four terms, don't worry about those. So 21, 22, 24. I want you to just focus on number 23. The reason being is most things that we model with polynomials, quadratic is the most common one. And even though this isn't a quadratic, you can turn it into a quadratic because notice how they all have ends. Remember, the first thing you should try is pulling out a GCF. Well, what's a GCF? Well, we can for sure pull out an n squared. Okay, so divide everything by n squared. But what about the numbers? Well, all these are divisible. No, they're not divisible by two, so that won't work. They're not all divisible by six, but three is also a factor of six. All these numbers are divisible by three, so divide this by three, and then you get two. Divide n squared by n to the second, you get n squared. Divide 15 by three, you get five. Divide n cubed by n squared, you get a single n or an n to the first power. Divide negative nine by three, you get a minus Three, and if you divide n squared by n squared, there's no n's left. So this is the factored form, but they said factor completely. So check to see if you can maybe factor this a little further. So what I'm hoping is that I can split this thing here into like two different binomials. 
ah, man, there's a number that's not one that makes it hard, but the number's prime, so that makes it actually kind of easy. And also, oh, this is convenient. This number's prime too. It's number three right here. So I have two possibilities. It's either going to be a three here and a one here, or the one first and then the three second. Now I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to give it a shot. You can use the factor by grouping method, but like, but we don't really go into detail with that. Just the guess and check method works just fine. I'm going to try a three here and a one here and oh, let's see the signs. It's a minus. So let me just put different signs. I'm not sure what to do, but we got a plus three in. If we do that. And then if you do this right here, you got a minus two in. Let's see. That gives us a one in. We want a five in. No, this doesn't work at all. It's not the sign that's wrong. It's the number that's wrong. So let's changing the signs won't help us. We have to change the numbers. So let's put the three second and the one in the first little box. So we get, let's check it again, plus one in, if we do that, and then minus six in. All right, the good news is we have a five. The bad news is it's a negative five. We want a positive five. Well, if you want to change the signs, then change the sign. So if you change the signs here, it'll change the sign of this, whereas changing the numbers changes the number. So check it one more time, minus one in, plus six in. Hey, it'll work out if we do minus one in, plus six in, we get the plus five in, but we want it the whole time. So this is the answer factored completely. Now let me show you one more time how the quadratic formula, if you, uh, you know, come with that, um, you can do it by hand, of course, but the quadratic formula, doing the calculations, calculators are good at calculating. Let me put the 2, and then this is a plus 5, so the 5, and then negative 3 in there. Notice how one of my factors, one of my solutions is negative 3. So the fact that x plus 3, or in this case, n plus 3 is a solution, um, is, is given by the quadratic formula. So you can use that to give you hints. If this doesn't make sense to you, like if you're like, wait, but I don't understand how you go from here to here. Then don't worry about this. But knowing how to reverse engineer this is just really a really useful skill. For 25, we're asked to find the side length, but we're given the area. But one little clue here, we're told it's a square painting. Well, that means that the length and width have to be the same. So if we factor this, we know it's going to be perfect squares. The square root of uh, 81 is 9. So for the sides, I can do 9 and 9, and P and P, and then 5 and 5, and then the middle term will just happen to work out. You can check it, though. 9 times 5 is 45P, and this is another 45P. That's where the 90P comes from. So you can write it. This is it factored. If you write 9P plus 5 squared, that is this thing, but they want to know just one side. So technically, the side is just writing one of the 9P plus fives, one of those factors, you know, length or width, is one side of that square. This is an open-ended question, so I just want to know, can you write a trinomial with degree five? And you can use any variable you want. I'm going to use the variable x, but, so x to the fifth power, that's a monomial of degree five, because there's only a single uh, term there. Now, if I do plus two x to the fourth, I could put any number for the coefficient, um, that's a binomial of degree 5. Now if I do plus uh, 9, these are three different terms that can't be combined. So trinomial, degree 5, because it's the highest degree. When you're calculating the degree of a polynomial and everything separated by addition, you, you just choose the highest degree. So this is just one of infinitely many examples that are answers to that question. All right, for this one, we're asked to explain how the sphere of the property works. So I'm going to use as my example something I've been using like just one of the examples I've already done. So if you look at like number 10, for instance, I like using this example because the flow method doesn't work. Um, the reason it's distributive property is you take each term of the first times each term of the second. So each term of the first times each term of the second, or E-T-O-T-F-T-O-T-O-T-S. Right, that's just kind of a joke, but this is how we summarize. Instead of using foil, you could use e tof t dots to explain this. But as long as you can say something to this effect, 
that you're multiplying each term of the first factor by each term of the second factor or every other factor, um, if there's more than one factors, but we're just gonna be dealing with two in this test. That is what distributive property is doing. So, and you can see it with the little arcs, you know, we're distributing the 4s, which is um, the first term in the first factor to everything in the second factor. We're not multiplying the 4s to the five. We don't multiply the terms of one factor by the other terms of that factor. Remember, you're only shaking hands with the people who are riding in a different vehicle from you. You know, when you arrive at a party, you greet and shake hands with the people who rode in a different vehicle from you. That's distributive property. This is a slightly more fun area problem. So we want to find the area of this figure. So you notice how we have, it's, it's kind of like a rectangle, but it's missing like this chunk right here. So you can just take the area of the big square. You can really view this as two squares. That's one way to look at it. So there's this, this big, I shouldn't say square, I should say rectangle, that big rectangle. But we cut out this little rectangle. So it's the 3x times 2x plus 1 is a big rectangle. And we, you find that area by doing the base times the height. And then we subtract from that the area of the little rectangle, which that area of that little rectangle is 2x wide. And it's x plus 1 tall. This, the x plus 1 represents this part right here. And then you just, you just calculate that and write your answer as a polynomial on standard. So we, you know, distribute this, you get 6x squared plus 3x, and then distribute this, negative 2x squared, and then minus 2x, because this is a negative, you distribute that part. And at that point, you just combine like terms, which comes out to 4x squared minus 1x or minus just x. For this one, we're just experimenting with different ways that you could put numbers in here and still be able to factor that. So x squared plus something x plus 24. And it comes from understanding what the factors are built up from. So I'm actually going to work this a little backwards. So I'm going to write the possible factorizations I think of when I see a 24. So I can do 24 times 1. Or I could do, I'm just going to put a little... Uh, quotation marks, I could do 8 times 3, uh, I could do 12 times 2, you know, and still have the x's, I could do um, 6 times 4, so all of the um, so this is the factorizations, and the middle number, like for this one, the middle number would be a 25, because if you had 24, 1, it would be an 11 for the second factorization. It would be a 15, because, I'm you know, oh, sorry, 14, because the 12 and 2. And this would be a 10. And I think I covered them all. But the idea is that just because you have, you know, a single number on the end, like it's the, just the number on the end isn't enough to tell you how to factor it. You got to use the number in the middle, because just in this one, you know, there's at least four possibilities, at least that I, um, oh, they only asked for three. But so. I gave as I think I gave them all. For this one right here, we have the uh, they say it's a perfect square trinomial, so that's what this means. It means it's like perfect square means you know like nine times nine eighty one. So that means that this number has to be an eighteen. For this next one, it's a perfect square trinomial again. So you know this is going to be a four and a four particularly a 4y and a 4y. Now here's what's hard is ah, we're given the middle term but not the end so that that seems like you'd have to guess and check for a while but if you remember um, that this number is really gotten from you take this number times this number and double it we can reverse engineer that by instead of you know like taking the middle number dividing it by 2 you get 28 so that you know that 4 times 7 is 28 and since we have a negative in the middle of a perfect square trinomial, it means that these will both be minuses. But you can check for yourself. This will be the right answer. And that's how I did it by dividing the middle term by 2 then figuring out what you got to multiply. All right, last one, sort of similar. Um, it's a perfect square trinomial. So they, they tell us that the numbers, like, you know, are going to be the same here. So I know 5 and 5 go here. 
Well, the 30 is built up of, you know, this 5 times whatever this mystery number is in front of P and doubling it. Well, if I divide by 2, I get 15. So what times 5 gives you 15? 3 does. And you can check to make sure 5 times 3 is 15. 5 times 3 is 15. The 30P. So this is your, this is the, the answer they're looking for is the 3. Um, or actually, psych, just kidding. If you do 3 times 3, you get 9. So the answer is actually 9 that goes in right here. And similarly for the last one, technically the answer they're looking for, that is a 49 that goes right there. Because 7 times 7 is 49. So just to be clear, the thing they're looking for on 30 is 18, on 31 is 49, and they're looking for the coefficient of the p squared. They're looking for the 9 right there. Okay, final one. Um, we want to write this from this form right here into this form where we just have something squared minus something else squared. Well, what we're going to do first is kind of expand this out. If you do x minus 2 squared, we get x squared minus 4x plus 4. And then there's the, um, you know, the minus 9 sort of thing. Or, sorry, let me back up a bit. So it's the a squared minus the b squared. So if you look at it, it's, you know, this is this thing squared. That's the a. And then this, this thing squared. Well, that's the hard part. So the a is like the x minus 2. The b, well, what do you square to get a 9? Well, the b is a 3. And so this is the, this is the a, this is the and then they want to take this and factor it. So now I'm going to take that and do x squared minus 4x plus 4. And then there's the minus 9. Combine these. Uh, see, that's minus 5. And then that could factor into x. Mm, x and x. I know it's going to be a 5 and a 1. And since the 5 is negative, like because the 4 is negative, I'm like 5 negative. So there you go. That's just a little more practice and factoring this. All right, that's it.